All right, I want to ask as usual, what did we talk about last time? Testing and production, A-B testing, different release strategies. Um, mm -hmm. What does this have to do with machine learning, AI? You want to do those things? Because it's there's a, <laughs> a lot of uncertainty. Um, like uh, it's very hard to replicate production data, so your testing is, you know, uh, only so good. Right. So um, you always have problems if you're testing with a fixed data set. A of how to curate this, how to not introduce kind of bias and overfitting. Right. So production data is unseen data that you can't cheat with. So it's nice for this purpose. And then the other aspect is that you can actually test the qualities that you care about, which may or may not relate to the accuracy of the model. Right? So you can actually test how well uh, a system is doing a task at the system goal level rather at the modeling level. Right? And then we talked about all kinds of things uh, that make this difficult, right? designing telemetry and how to do this and kind of noise and you might want to use a t-test to find statistical significance, all these kind of things. Sounds good. So today I have, again, one of those lectures where I have way too much material, and then I want, also want to stop about 15 minutes early at the end um, to talk a little bit about the project and get you get together in your groups um, to do a little bit of planning. Um, so Today, I want to talk more broadly about data quality and data engineering. We'll see how far we get. Um, the data quality is one of those big problems that data scientists face. Um, there are a bunch of studies that put kind of the amount of data wrangling and data cleaning, kind of getting data and dealing with data somewhere around 60 to 80 to 90% of their job. I think you saw this in the second homework assignment where you collected some data. This wasn't so much about cleaning, but about getting the data from different sources. Right? And I heard from a bunch of you that the main difficulty in that homework assignment was actually getting the data, processing the data at scale. This is fairly common. And data cleaning is one of those things that you often have data, you have data from different sources, but it's not always in the best quality and you kind of want to deal with that. Um, and so today I want to talk a little bit about different aspects of data quality. I'm going to race through some of those things and spend a little bit more time on others. Um, and I want to start with a scenario as usual. So I want to take a very classic kind of machine learning thing um, that, that has been one of the earlier use cases, kind of predicting when you buy things in a store, right? So you have stuff on the shelves. So for example, down there, that's Giant Eagle. That's the roof of Giant Eagle, right there, the local supermarket. So there, um, this is how you see how I can come up with my case studies, right? Um, they are buying stuff that they put on the shelves, right? And then stuff gets bought and they need to restock at some point. And they need to make decisions about how much do they buy, when, how much are they restocking? And that's kind of a prediction. Right, so you're predicting we are going to sell this much, this many peaches, right? So then you're buying peaches for the next week. You can probably order for different days, maybe order more at one day, uh, get a special delivery if you're running out. And you want to optimize this. You want to optimize that you're ordering enough that you're not running out, but that you're also not ordering too much that you need to throw it away or that it sits on the shelf forever. So I want to start so you can think of there's some machine learning component in there, maybe multiple machine learning components that would do this task, right? It used to be humans kind of in the departments making decisions about their, how much they're ordering this, but you can automate this. You can automate some of this, take the human out of the loop a little bit. And I wanna start by asking what kind of data sources you think a machine learning algorithm 
might use, kind of a model might use, that we might use to make those predictions. And I just want to collect a couple of things again. So what do you think, what kind of information would we want to use? Um, so sales over time. I'm not sure what spatial dimensions mean in this context. Basically different regions might demand different products. All right, yeah. Um, let's say we're doing uh, predictions for this shop down there, but sure, um, right? Cases when data was out of stock, so um, stock history or something, how much was on the shelf at any point in time. Special events, okay. Like holidays, um, you might buy different things over Eastern versus Thanksgiving versus a normal day of the week. What else might influence how much you're buying, how much you're buying of what shelf life. So you, you probably have some sort of product database, the shelf life and prices potentially, right? You might buy more stuff if it's cheaper. Um, yeah, you have maybe information from competitors, right? Um, I'm not sure how you get this, but um, Yep. Um, uh, producer database with delivery times. Um, logistic efficiency would fit into this. Any other information? Probably have maybe some user preferences, some store layout, maybe th theft uh, history. Maybe you're tracking this to some point or you're tracking when you're running out versus how much you have sold and kind of see how much you're losing. Um, you might want to know what the marketing campaign is for that week. Um, maybe something is on sale. So, a bunch of things, right? And what you see here is that we have data from many possible different sources, which is kind of common. Um, you could also go kind of push this much more into research territory and kind of look at Twitter for trends, right? That you're kind of seeing a trend early, um, that you kind of have um, maybe online some some influencer or some some database of 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 kind of sales trends, maybe you have some um, market analyzing thing, uh, some semi-human thing that you subscribe to, right? So many different sources, and some of them are more curated than others, and some are more problematic or noisy than others. So you're expecting you have a bunch of databases in some form, right? Data in some form, so you may have the products, you may have how much you have in stock at any point, how much you have sold at any point, and a bunch of other things that we just talked about, right? They might come in different formats from different sources. And now we want to think about what makes good data quality. And we can break this down in many different places. This is what I took, I think, from some book. Um, doesn't really matter how we break it down, but there are many different forms of quality that we can also think about for data, right? So we want accuracy for data, and we can talk about uh, precision versus accuracy here. Uh, we want completeness, we want uniqueness, we want consistency, we want timeliness. And let's just go back to this and think about what might be one problem in each case. What might be an accuracy problem for any of these data sources? So accuracy is if you're not recording the right data. What would be a simple example, a plausible example in this scenario? Cash sales are not tracked in the system. Yeah, for, for whatever reason, right? Uh, we're missing just something. Um, 
Also completeness when relevant data wasn't recorded. Similarly, we're missing some sales for some reason or we're getting shipments from somebody, but for some reason it, we only get the paper receipt and it doesn't make it into the system, right? So our database might be incomplete. Uniqueness is maybe the opposite, right? Somebody gets this paper receipt and they enter it twice or by some reason we're du duplicating the entry. Um, what might be a consistency issue? Righty. Uh, so some information might be uh, available in multiple places. Like for example, we have sales and we also have stock info. And we have, say if you have product database then something like a product ID could be there. Like some information could be there in multiple places uh, in, from multiple sources we collect, but there, sh there should be a way uh, using which we can map these things together. Like if you want all information for one product, is it possible uh, to collate the data from multiple sources and map okay. it to one product. So, so one example would be we have, we're selling peaches and we want to know from our provider database how many we got and in our sales database how many we have sold, um, right? And kind of to match this together and we need to match them around peaches, right? And if we have different kinds of peaches, make, make sure that they're matching. Um, and they're, right, so, um, Zichung says, uh, if in inventory says 20 items were sold, but we only have 10 that were checked out or 10 that we ever bought, right? So those are inconsistencies. Um, or um, yeah, one so source kind of just groups all chili peppers together, even though we have different varieties in a different source, right? So um, a bunch of these things happen and different data sources may use different terms and so on. And timeliness. Uh, what might be data that's maybe, or what might be a plausible reason that data might be out of date, um, kind of slow to be entered in, in the supermarket scenario? Yeah, Leo? So, so as far as I know, a lot of the inventory managing system of US supermarkets are still using very old software based on, I think, even backing Windows XP, some kind of architectures. Uh, so with very old systems, there's a high chance that they will temporarily break down. And when things break down to restore data takes a lot of time and that could, uh, that, that could uh, lead to data out of date. Yeah, you could have a system going down or maybe just offline so they're caching things and they don't get entered. Another thing is maybe you get receipts from the vendors in paper form and you need to enter them and somehow you don't do this for a day or two, right? So it might be a little bit out of date. Um, so there are many different forms that data can be noisy, right? Um, we don't have very obvious sensor examples here. Maybe checkout counters where maybe you scan something or miss to scan something or use something incorrectly, right? But um, kind of scanning something at the checkout is probably fairly accurate, but not super accurate. Um, may have some weird computations, somewhere crashes, duplicate data, near duplicate data we talked about, out of order data as well, if it's delayed, and then just plain wrong format, right? So somebody fills in, they get a paper receipt and they fill it in and they just fill in the wrong stuff in the wrong form, right? So they, uh, instead of saying 10 peaches, they say, say peaches 10, it's uh, like the name is in the wrong column or something like this, right? Um, all kinds of possible problems. And then also a bunch of things change over time. So the system objectives may change, software components may change and be upgraded, right? The prediction models themselves may change. Um, the quality of the supplied data may change, user behavior changes, assumptions may change. Let me again, get a few examples. Does the objective of the system for inventory prediction ever change? I'm, I'm not sure how clear the objective was in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because you could have an objective like we never want to have an empty shelf. Or you could say, you know, you always want to have the freshest goods or 
you never want to run out of one. Pro so I think yep. you could define a lot of objective functions within your problem description. Right, and that might change over time, right? Um, do you have an example when the quality of the supplied data may change over time? So again, for example, you get the paper receipts from the vendors whenever they ship something to you and you have a new person typing this in, right? And they're maybe not trained or you buy a new scanner and it, or have a new software to do this and it's suddenly much more accurate. Um, maybe you upgrade all your cash out terminals and um, for some reason that's now higher quality and uh, fewer mistakes. Um, maybe the marketing campaign or the Twitter data or whatever external data you get, um, what did we talk about? Kind of special events that just much more accurately tracked, right? Before you kind of just had a few things, now you're tracking way more. Um, user behavior changes, this might be somewhat obvious. There's like an E. coli outbreak and people stop, stop buying lettuce. Sure, that's one example. Uh, there's probably hundreds of examples why somebody would buy stuff more or less, right? This is one, um, right? And then, yeah, a lot of these um, are assumptions about the environment. Um, uh, you could think about nobody would buy more than 20 rolls of toilet paper at one point. Right, as a, as a reasonable assumption that you typically have that suddenly gets violated, uh, kind of again, consumer behavior changes. Um, and then you have kind of the feedback loop things, right? So users can react to the model output and users can try to game, deceive the model. Um, a vendor might try to buy their own products, lots of them in a short time span, um, maybe return them, but uh, kind of, create a peak in demand, right? Kind of to track this, that the supermarket wants to buy more. Um, bunch of examples like this. Uh, let me skip some of these things. Um, so when we think about machine learning, data quality and quantity is important. Typically, kind of as a rule of thumb, if you have more data, you get better models, right? So the more data you have, the more you can learn about unusual things, the better you can usually generalize. Although in most modeling techniques, there's a point of diminishing returns, right? So at some point you have so much data that even doubling the data will give you only very little marginal accuracy, right? So for different kinds of modeling techniques and different kinds of problems, this is at different points. This is maybe hard to predict upfront how much data you need, but you usually want a lot of data. And for some problems, you need a huge amount of data. The more noisy your data is, the less confident your models are or the more data you need. Uh, it depends a little bit on the modeling technique, how robust they are. A lot of techniques can deal with noise quite well um, that they kind of see here lots of similar data points. There's a, quite a big distribution, but they take the average. So if you just see a lot of, a lot of different data points, um, they might kind of be able to deal with this if you have enough data. If you have only very little data and on top of that this noisy, you might overfit to very wrong or you might learn wrong patterns, right? Um, you might be very not confident. And if you have inaccurate data, um, you might get completely misleading or maybe I should get back to this point actually. Um, I should briefly talk about the difference between accuracy and precision. Um, most of you have seen this probably before. If, you, if there's a real value, like how many peaches are on the shelf in the supermarket, an accurate measure will give you the right number. And a precise measure will give you the same number if you measure repeatedly. 
Right? So you can have a measure that's accurate and precise. It will tell you there's 100 peaches on the shelf. And if you count again, there's again 100 peaches. And if you count again, there's again 100 peaches or 101. Right? Um, most software metrics are very precise. If you measure multiple times, you get the, right num the same number. You might get a metric that's very precise but inaccurate. So there are 100 peaches there, but whenever you count, it says 200 peaches. Consistently counts double the number of peaches. Right? This is very precise. It gives you the same number over and over again, but it's not accurate. It returns the wrong number. And then you have accurate but imprecise things. So for example, if you ask 100 people to estimate in this pile of peaches how many peaches there are, maybe on average you get close to 100, right? So some people may estimate 50, some 200. And if you average it out over the large number of numbers, you might get fairly close to the accurate, uh, to the accurate result. But it's a very imprecise measure. Right? So the, the difference here is um, precision you can deal with, or imprecision you can deal with by just repeatedly measuring this. This is kind of annoying, but you kind of have to, um, you can, performance measurements are another example where you just repeat the measurements and take the average and you get closer to the real thing. Um, accuracy is something that you can't easily replace. So if a metric consistently tells you double the amount of time, um, that's a bias that you can't really deal with and that you can't deal with with statistics. Um, so except for spelling mistakes, the difference between precision and precision and recoil and precision and accuracy and precision is they're completely different concepts. Um, they just accidentally have the same name, um, right? So precision and accuracy is Precision here is really repeated measurements. How close do you get the same result? Whereas precision and recall is very much about kind of of the things that you're predicting, how many of those are actually true, right? So they have nothing to do with each other. So kind of coming back to this difference, if you have imprecise measurements, kind of precision problems, machine learning can often deal with this because they can average over noisy data. Um, this is distracting, thanks. <laughs> um, but inaccuracy, um, inaccurate data is something that you can't really deal with, right? So if, uh, if your data is consistently off, your model will learn based on wrong data. So there is a need when you, whenever you're doing machine learning to get the right data, to get accurate data, to deal with kind of wrong data and ideally also to get less noisy data, right? More precise data. So it's very useful to uh, invest in data quality. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but I want to kind of bring this up. Um, exploratory data analysis is one of those steps that data scientists should do. It's one of the main recommendations, always do this, um, but it's, very often people don't. Exploratory data analysis essentially means before you even start with machine learning or anything, try to understand the data, try to look at what you have. I just wanna kind of take an example here. Um, this is a notebook um, on housing price analysis. So somewhat similar to an earlier example that we had in class. Um, it starts by importing a bunch of stuff and then loading a certain housing data set. So it's California housing prices, you have the location, you have the um, median age of houses in that neighborhood, the number of rooms, the number of bedrooms, um, the population in that neighborhood and so on, how close you are to the ocean and then you're trying to predict the housing price. And we could just take all those features, throw them in the model and see how, what accuracy we get. But the useful way of kind of approaching this is, let's first look at the data. What kind of data do we have? What does this actually mean? So longitude, we, we might kind of look at the distribution of data, right? It's between minus 114 to minus 124. So you, you can kind of understand what this might mean in terms of longitude. It's probably no extreme outlier here. Um, 
you see house median age of houses kind of makes sense as probably years, right? Total number of rooms. Doesn't seem to be the number of rooms, maybe square feet. Um, so you might want to go back and this might not mean what you think it means. Also, it has very big outliers here. This is the first step. It's very common to actually visually explore the data. So this is just plotting where these things are and what the values are. So you kind of get a sense of whether the data makes sense, right? So if there was a kind of big green area here, kind of or blue, very high housing prices over here, you would probably not trust the data too much. Um, this seems plausible. Then it's very common to kind of do some plots to just check kind of how is the data distributed. Like most things are not close to the ocean. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's a common thing um, where you look for correlations, what's happening here. Uh, so here they are just plotting a bunch of distributions, right? So if you see this total number of dead uh, bedrooms, you might wanna think about whether maybe for machine learning, you want to transform this into something that's more normally distributed or between zero and one. And that's also a useful thing to see just visually, are there any strong correlations between data? So I don't know which ones they are, but this thing and this thing here, households and total number of bedrooms seem to be strongly correlated, right? Um, this may not matter for some machine learning techniques, but it helps a lot to understand the data, right? So why am I talking about this? Well, a data scientist should do these things anyway to understand what they're working with, right? To understand the quality of their data, but also when we're building these systems, um, it helps to understand what kind of inputs and outputs are we working with? What are the kind of distributions that we are expecting? Are we expecting lots of outliers? Are we expecting clean data, very unclean data? What kind of assumptions can we make about the data? Um, maybe we can test some of those as assertions at runtime, right? Kind of the shape of the data, um, things like this. All right. Now there's a huge step in data cleaning and I don't really wanna spend the time to go all through all of this. Um, you can slice and dice data cleaning in many different ways. There are many different activities that we can work about here. So we can talk about different kinds of problems. So examples where you simply have completely broken input formats, right? This is ill formatted. Um, you have kind of dependencies that are not met where kind of the age doesn't match with the birth date. Um, you can have things where um, values are wrong, where things are misspelled. Um, some of them are about specific data. Some of them are about relationships of multiple data that are not consistent. So there, there are lots of these kind of possible discussions. Um, and there are many, let me see, there are many different tools and techniques. Um, the classic approaches are outlier detection and removal data deduplication, detecting duplicates, some sort of transformation, some rule-based data cleaning, identifying consistencies and rules, and then some kind of probabilistic reasoning about probable rules and so on for data cleaning. So there's a, um, this comes mostly out of the database community. They've been looking at this for decades. Um, this has a lot of additional attention these days because a lot of companies are building huge, huge data sets and need to deal with this. Right? So there are currently hundreds of startups in this space that are doing something with data quality in some way. So a lot of kind of the classic techniques are coming back. I just wanna go through some of the kind of basic things that are kind of easy to apply. Right, so the first thing is to use a data schema. The data schema essentially just describes constraints on the format of the uh, data, kind of expected fields and so on. I suspect most of you know this from SQL, kind of classic relational databases define, you have tables and then they define what the data looks like, right? So the employee table has an employee number, which is an integer, which cannot be null. It always needs to be provided. It's also a primary key, which means it needs to be unique. No two employees can have the same number, right? And then there needs to be a birth date, which is a date. So you can't enter something that's ill formatted into this database, right? So at least it follows a certain consistency rule. And then on top of this, you can also have, um, yeah, you have 
more things. You can say also the department name can be concrete. And then you have foreign keys as well, where you essentially establish relationships between tables. Like you can only have a department manager if that employee number exists in the other database. Right, so those kind of rules, those kind of constraints are fairly common. Interestingly, if we look at modern data science, we work a lot with CSV files and data frames and very frequently not without, um, not with any schemas, right? So we dump stuff into JSON files, into CSV files and do or not check them. So here's the input data that I used for the homework assignment uh, with the movie streaming thing. It was essentially a CSV file, which wasn't comma separated, but colon separated for some reason, um, right, in this format. It actually had this format throughout, but there is no data format that tells me that the first thing is a number, it's unique. The second thing is a string or maybe has two parts, right? This is convention and actually it worked here, but my parser for this now assumes this format and if I would get any different input, it might crash, it might just say array out of bounds, right? These kind of things. Um, also in this thing here, um, I have gender, I have occupation, um, but it's not from a fixed, or it doesn't tell me what the valid values are and so on, right? So this is where you often come back to data exploration where you get the CSV file and you first of all look at what do I actually have, right? What's the format? It's actually a good idea to enforce some schema um, when you're parsing things, right? So that you actually, if you assume this is a format of your data, actually parse it, actually check that it consists, that it fits this format, right? Um, that you have a meaningful error message if it doesn't. Um, there's a lot of push in modern tools to adopt some schema also for kind of JSON files and CSV files. Um, there are a couple of competing uh, tools. Apache Avro is one that uh, Kafka supports. I haven't set this up for the stream that I gave you, um, but what you can do there is you can say, again, this is a, it's a record, has a name and then certain fields and those fields have types, right? So this is specified in some JSON format, but it essentially is similar to the SQL schema in that it defines what does a record, an entry in a Kafka stream look like. And then whenever you write something or read something from the stream, it can use this to validate that it actually corresponds to the format. And you can use this to generate automatic parsers and um, serialization mechanisms and so on. Right, so this exists for a lot of languages, for a lot of tools, um, often comes with ORM mappers, kind of um, things where you can kind of get a useful, nice API to, to access this. Um, if you're actually going beyond a notebook, if you're building an infrastructure that you actually want to maintain, have lots of data that you need to understand for a long time, makes a lot of sense to invest in some of this, right? To actually document what the structure of your data is and put in automatic checks. And these tools require some learning curve, right? So you need to understand how to use them, but then they're fairly useful and fairly low key, low overhead um, as, a, as a simple mechanism to enforce some form of data quality. Right, it doesn't enforce that the values are correct that are in there that if you have the birthday, it doesn't check that this is a plausible birthday. It just checks that it's in a date format, right? It's not just a random string, um, but that's one step, um, a first step to actually enforce that's quite useful. All right, um, I think for our inventory system, this is fairly straightforward. We, I think I kind of implicitly assumed for all the data that you gave here, we probably have some sort of database, some relational database that maybe already has a schema, at least the way that I've shown it here kind of implies that. A bunch of those things might also be CSV files, right? Uh, in very different formats, like the product database might come in a CSV file from the vendor or in a JSON format. Um, but in general, yes, at some point we need to ingest the data from all these different sources and try to understand what we're doing. We're going to talk a little bit about this process of ingesting data from huge number of different sources. 
um, on Thursday. I actually have a guest speaker who has been working with machine learning in production since the mid 90s. Um, and he's going to talk about um, especially this problem, how in a company you have all these different data sets and how you kind of need to integrate them uh, to make sense out of this and so on. All right. So schema is one thing. Schema seems kind of easy. This is also in the reading. Um, most of the work in this Amazon uh, paper was about schema enforcement. There was a little bit of work on kind of enforcing distributions, but most of it is really just schema enforcement. And they figured out how to actually do this at scale, right? The other thing is actually looking at inconsistencies in data, looking at rules, at dependencies. Um, so if you have a lot of data, you can, or often you have redundancy in data. So for example, the city, city and a state together should uniquely, no, the other way around, a zip code should uniquely identify the city and state together. Right? There are some areas where I think this is a little bit ambiguous, where you could have two different names. For some reason, you can have Monroeville and Pittsburgh. You can write either one of those in some zip codes. Um, but usually there, there's a fairly fixed ro rule. And if you have a zip code um, that completely doesn't mit match the Pittsburgh area, right? This would be an outlier and something that you detect. So you have a certain, you often have certain redundancy in data um, and certain rules and certain consistency mechanisms. You also have certain distributions like Chicago is very common versus whereas this spelling here is not very common. So you might learn that this is probably an outlier, right? Cons uh, looking at the rest of the data. Um, or um, I think this suggests that different, um, those have the same zip code, but the street address of different zip codes, but the street address otherwise is exactly the same, which seems implausible, right? Probably again, an outlier here. So there are many different ways to think about this, but it often boils down that you have some sort of rules that create some invariance across data, across one uh, table or across multiple tables or across multiple rows, right? So the typical things are, um, multiple attributes from the same or from multiple data sources. Um, but also things like things should be unique. Um, things should refer to something that's in a different table. Um, a lot of cl classic integrity constraints that I've shown you in databases fit into this category. Um, and there's a bunch of old, a newer work to mine those rules as well, right? So if you're just giving a CSV file, you might wanna figure out what are some of those rules here. So if you have some external database of zip codes and addresses, you can use that to check your data. But if you have enough data, you can also mine that, kind of figure out, oh, Pittsburgh should be in this zip code range, for example, right? Learn this from data. There are a couple of kind of classic algorithms that given a data set, assuming everything is clean, it can find functional relationships. For example, it can figure out that um, kind of the, the zip code relationship to a city, um, like the zip or the city always uniquely identifies the zip code or the other way around. Um, there are also algorithms that can do this under conditions uh, where they can figure out under this condition, this value always implies this other value, right? So with this street address, this zip code implies this other thing. Um, and you can also find things that are mutually exclusive. If you have mostly clean data, if you're not sure that your training data is clean, uh, you can also have a probabilistic view where you only look for common rules. Um, and then once you see loop violations, um, you can either get some uh, user feedback kind of to fix those or kind of get more feedback to learn this or just learn um, rules. Have you seen association rule mining before? So this is a very classic old machine learning techniques that's often used kind of in exploratory data analysis. Um, the idea is that you find dependencies in data. So uh, the classic example is that you have a bunch of sales 
again in the supermarket. So the first person buys these two items, the second person buys these two items. And now you want to figure out if X is bought, then Y is also bought. And they're kind of classic algorithms that do this. These rules don't usually hold for all data. This is a probabilistic algorithm. But what it might find is that if diaper and beer gets bought together, then also milk gets bought often. And there are typically two values that are shown here. Um, support and confidence. Support says, out of all the data that I've seen, in how many rows has this rule applied? So here we see this rule applies in two out of um, the five rules, so 40%. And confidence is out of the, how did this work? Um, out of the things where diaper and beer are bought together, so not all rules, but only where the precondition is fulfilled, how often is milk then actually bought as well? Right, so confidence says how strong this implication is and support says how often this occurs in the entire data set. And they're relatively easy um, to understand algorithms um, that in some machine learning classes you would implement yourself like the a priori algorithm, how to get a big table of data and find those rules. Um, so what you're looking for are typically high confidence rules with a certain amount of support. Right, not super high support, but um, they should occur at least a couple of times in the data set that you have some confidence. Right, so you might learn that if the zip code is 15213, um, then with very, very high support, the, the place is Pittsburgh, right? And this is true for maybe 1% in your data or even less than that. So support is not super high, but if you see this relationship, then it's very certain. Right, so it's kind of a probabilistic way of finding rules in the data. And again, this is similar to looking for correlations in data, right? But it's looking for dependencies between, correlations is looking for kind of, yeah, correlations between multiple columns. This would look for dependencies and this can help you to understand your data as well. Does this make sense? This can be quite a useful tool just to kind of find things. Um, in software engineering, this actually also has a history. I don't have the time to go through this, but there's a, quite a bit of work on finding invariance in executions, so likely preconditions or postconditions in software. Some of you may have seen the DICON tool or something like this. Um, so you're trying to figure out things like this could be a precondition for some function or post condition. Um, I have an example here. So if, you, if you're running this code here with a bunch of different inputs, for example, for the absolute function, you might learn that, um, uh, what do you learn? That, uh, grip. so you might learn kind of inv invariant like this, where you figure out uh, that if it's larger than zero, then it's X, otherwise it's smaller than X. Um, and there's a way to kind of just observe this. You observe a lot of data point and then you find rules that um, have very high, uh, that have some reasonably high support and very high confidence. And if you have those rules, you can use them for repair as well. There are a bunch of tools out there that do this. One thing that I've seen recently is Holoclean, um, which is a tool that essentially does this kind of learning over data. It finds probable relationships, and then if it finds in, um, violations of those re relationships, if it's very confident about this, right? So it has seen that the zip code is clearly Pittsburgh, like 99% of the time, it might just change it for you, right? So you can repair data this way. If it's not so confident, it might flag it for human review or depending on what, what your level for data quality expectations is, you might just throw it out. Um, right, so th there are a couple of things. It usually gives you some confidence in kind of this is a rule violation. And then depending on the confidence, you can use it for repair or not. All right. Do you have some examples of rules that you might expect? Either rules that always hold 
or rules that mostly hold and are a strong indicator for kind of violations, either within one data set or across multiple data sets um, in this analysis part. Yeah, inventory should not be negative. Um, that's probably actually more data schema issue, right? This is only refers to a single data point, not the relationship of multiple data points. But it's an invariant that you could learn, right? So you can learn that it's an outlier to ever have a negative inventory. Anything else? Certainly all the address stuff works with supplier addresses and um, shelf lives shouldn't change over time. Yeah, probably, at least not drastically. If you get the same product from multiple vendors, maybe the prices should be within a similar range. Delivery time should be in a certain range, um, maybe depending on, on the day, right? So if you order on a Monday, delivery time should be under one day. If you order on a Friday, it might be larger. So you can ha have some of these dependencies of day to delivery time. Um, so there might be a bunch of these rules in here. Um, and if you just see kind of a sudden violation, this might be a data quality issue. Right, and then there's a question about how do you repair this? Um, do you flag it? Do you automatically repair it? Do you just delete the data? Um, do you just wait until you have, um, if it's just a little bit of noisy data, you might not mind. Um, all right, uh, just very quickly, you looked at this uh, paper as well. I just wanted to bring this up because I think it's a neat idea. It's essentially thinking about, we have all these static analysis tools in software engineering, right? Things that finds mistakes like in Java, you don't wanna have an assignment here. You actually want a comparison, an equal operator here, right? Um, or you have dead code after return statement. Um, and you have kind of a bunch of weird things. A lot of these things can be detected by static analysis or dynamic analysis of source code, right? So there's a question, is there also something that we can do to machine learning code to detect some inconsistencies, to detect some data problems? And the things that they talked about in the paper were things like wrong encoding, right? So kind of using strings as input to a machine learning algorithm that expects numbers or that uses enums as reals or the other way around, right? Um, outliers and scaling. So this may be not fully static, but more dynamic, but kind of looking at the distribution of data and the distribution is really long tailed and the machine learning mechanism can't deal with this very well. Maybe should encode the data, right? Certain packaging things. Um, I haven't seen much else in this area. I think there's some error checking with regard to deep neural networks, where it's very easy to make mistakes, but that's closer to type checking. Um, but I think there's, there's a potential here also to kind of look for more structural things or problems in your code that have more to do with the encoding than maybe with the original data quality. So I just wanted to keep this in here as a pointer. Any questions on this part or can we move on? All right, the, the main thing that I really still wanna talk about today is drift. And that's the problem that something changes over time and how to detect this. And this is a big problem, right? So if it's a data violation, kind of if the date format is invalid, that's easy to detect, right? If there's a rule violation, like the zip code is wrong, that's, we have techniques to detect this. But what do we do? 
if data actually changes or expectations change. And there are at least a few different things and they have slightly different names. They're not always cleanly uh, separated. There's the idea of concept drift where the idea is that for the same input, you expect different predictions over time, right? So you have a credit card transaction and today you would uh, flag this as um, fine and tomorrow the same transaction you might flag as potentially fraudulent, right? So the data hasn't changed, but the kind of things that we consider as fraudulent maybe because the kinds of attacks have changed in the real world, that has changed, right? So for the same data, we expect a different outcome. That means that the kind of concepts that we're predicting have changed. Data drift is slightly different. Data drift just means we're predicting different kinds of inputs and we're getting away from the inputs that we have trained on. Right, so for example, we have recognized a face recognition algorithm. And now people start wearing masks in the pandemic. The, for the same person, we still expect the same label, right? That hasn't changed, but we have trained on faces without masks. And now we have faces with masks that we haven't really trained on. So our, uh, we're trying to predict things that we haven't really learned on. So in both cases, what happens over time, if data or concepts drift, we expect worse predictions, right? Because we have trained on different data or the, the expectations on the training data have changed. And then there's also the problem that the out, upstream data may just change. It may change the formats. So for some reason, somebody has changed, we use the weather data and this has changed the format from um, Celsius to Fahrenheit or you use the movie data from IMDb and they change their rating system or they change how they format a, a certain column, right? Um, this has very abrupt changes. Um, so there you would typically expect that if your input data very suddenly looks very different, not because the, the word has changed so much, but the way that you collect the data has changed. So in these cases, if you have concept drift, how do you fix it? So let's take the credit card fraud example. It's very similar to the fraud example that you saw with advertisement in the first homework, right? The online advertisement. So the kind of attacks change, how do you deal with this? You, you have trained the model on some labeled data of attacks. what people are doing is changing. So for the same data, you might wanna classify this as an attack now, which was fine yesterday. Do you just relabel the data and retrain? Yep, you relabel and you retrain, or you collect new data. Um, but yes, you need to retrain and you need to relabel to do this. Um, for data drift, Just retrain, I think, right? Collect more data, right? More oh. training data and retrain, but you don't necessarily need to relabel the old data, right? Because you don't expect it to change. And if upstream data has changed, how would you fix that? Depends on the change, but let's say Fahrenheit to Celsius. Maybe just transform your data set so that it, yeah. I would probably just transform the input data uh, when it comes in before you use it for prediction, right? But if, if the rules are clear enough and you're not losing anything, uh, you can just convert it. So I wasn't using concept drift and data drift consistently as separate terms before. And I will often just refer to this as drift for the rest of the lecture. Um, when I tried to look into this, I also got the impression that 
papers don't necessarily make a very clear distinction here. And it's always, it's also kind of hard to, there are some cases where it's hard to make a distinction actually. Um, there might be cases where you can think about has a prediction changed or have we just not enough context for the prediction? Um, so actually the data has changed. So for example, if you're going with seasons, um, you're predicting different amounts of turkey sales around Thanksgiving, right? So in our inventory example, has the, has the prediction target changed or has the data changed? Right, so you can think about this as given that we have tur 10 turkeys on the shelf, how many turkeys should we buy? That has certainly changed, right? So in, the, in a sense, it's concept drift. But you can also think about this if we say for a certain date of the year, how many turkeys should we buy? And we have never trained on Thanksgiving data before, then we have just a gap in training data. Right? We kind of have foreseen of this. Uh, it's not that the concept has changed, it's just we're predicting for an area that we haven't trained on. So I'm not sure that you can always distinguish concept and data drift precisely. I think there are two separate ideas and you kind of address them in slightly different ways. Um, I would suggest if you talk to somebody about this, define what you mean. Right? So I think most people have a vague idea of kind of drift always happens, uh, but whether it's because the concept has changed or whether the data distribution has changed, um, it's not always super clear. So in both cases, the idea is though that if you don't do anything, you would detect a uh, dropping quality over time. Right? This is another reason why testing and production is very important. On the static data set, you wouldn't detect this. But if you're testing in production and you're, you're, either your concepts change or your data changes, you would expect lower and lower quality over time, right? And in both cases that we talked about fixing, you would expect to retrain new models, either closer to the data that you're observing or relabeling things, right? So that you would expect kind of to always improve up. But this is also a reason why you need to retrain and practice all the time. How would you find concept drift? So one thing is you just see quality dip, right? This is probably a good indicator that something is wrong. Can you think of other things that you would use? So it's kind of for similar input data, you're expecting different outcome data over time. So you can look at the distribution of outputs for kind of similar data, right? So if you're doing the same kind of prediction for a lot of people over and over again, and your telemetry tells you that what was previously correct most of the time is now increasingly considered as incorrect by people, right? So telemetry data for the same output is kind of rated differently. That could be an indication. It just requires that you also have telemetry data actually. Um, so kind of drift on telemetry probably helps. Um, you can probably ask um, humans to label some data, some telemetry data or some regular data. Is this a credit card? Is this a fraudulent credit card transaction? Is this a proper kind of um, amount of peaches that we are buying? Um, if the labels change over time on the same data that people label, that would be an indication. There's a fairly expensive way to do this. And I think one strategy could be if you have an interpreter model, which you can actually understand what the model is doing, you might be able to judge, oh, this is no longer the right model. I don't know if there are any better strategies. This is not my area of expertise. There's hundreds of papers on this topic, but they're typically kind of very statistical detection mechanisms. And I think in practice, what people mostly do is they, they look at how much is there telemetry data telling them that model quality is going down over time, right? So it's really look for, look for this curve. If it's going down, it's time to retrain, right? 
possibly relabel. Um, data drift, oh yeah, so this is another reason why you really want monitoring, right? You really need telemetry, you really need monitoring. Um, for data drift, it's often easier. Um, data drift, you can detect that distributions have changed. This is where we're coming back to kind of what, we, what I've shown you in kind of the exploratory data analysis, right? So if you know that in your training data, um, you're expecting most houses to be far away from the ocean and only few houses near the ocean. And then you suddenly see in the production data that you're working live, almost everything is on an island, right? This kind of indicates that something has changed, right? Your training data was not representative of this. And you can use this on a single feature like this, or you can use it on the data in general, right? Is the data that you learned close, uh, that you're making predictions and practice close to the data that you trained on? There's actually a bunch of techniques here. Um, anomaly detection is one of them where you can just see, is this very unusual data? You can check what's the distance to training data. Um, and then there are a bunch of approaches that use statistics in some way to kind of figure out how representative is this. Is this uh, kind of an out of distribution sample or are we getting further away? You can also look at um, the, the representations of labels, the distribution of labels and whether that changes, right? So if in your training data, the housing prices were like this and then uh, the actual prices that you're predicting are much higher, this might be an indication that something has drifted, right? So the prediction data, the production data is not representative or the training data is no longer representative of the production data. And again, you can do a lot of statistics or you can just plot it and look for kind of changes over time, right? Gradual changes or jumps. Sudden changes, jumps are usually signs of something has changed in the data format or kind of something has changed very abruptly or attacks on the system. Right, and gradual changes are usually some sign of some drift over time. Um, so simply just plotting kind of distribution over time, these are box plots, I think, or kind of error bars uh, can be useful just to see whether the input data is kind of similar. Right, so there, there are a number of different techniques, but I think a lot of time just kind of simple descriptive techniques are probably fairly reasonable. Um, and there are also a couple of tools um, that some of the machine learning frameworks uh, do, like Asia has a data drift dashboard. I don't actually understand what they're really doing, um, but they're, they're looking at how data changes over time. And then they're also telling you which of your features change most over time. And so they're change, telling you data in general changes over time and then um, some of the data more specifically. So, how am I doing on time? I have essentially no time left if I want to give you some time for, for, for the teams. So, we can think about um, a drift in the inventory system, right? So, there are different forms of drift that we, um, you might expect that um, by how many features you buy goes up and down um, uh, with the seasons. Um, let me... One second. Um, I need, um, let's see whether I break everything by making sure you host. No, still seems to continue. Um, I just need to, to prepare breakout rooms in a second. Um, so there are all kinds of drift that you might expect with the seasons, with special events, with um, the pandemic, right? So toilet paper or the E. coli out outbreak with salad, right? A bunch of things that might suddenly change. They might change what you predict, but also um, they might change what kind of data you're seeing and whether it's representative. All right. I'm gonna skip this, me uh, this topic for, um, the next lecture, because I want to talk briefly about um, uh, about the next homework assignment. So 
You have one homework assignment that's due tonight. Um, there will be more, two more individual assignments later, but we're starting a group project. I, up, so this is a project that goes until the end of the semester, ends with a presentation and has multiple milestones. Um, kind of usually one week projects or so with milestones. The idea is um, to work again on the, um, with the simulator that I gave you on, on the movie watching behavior, but this time instead of predicting the popularity of a movie, you're actually making recommendations about which movies to watch. So in this project, I want you to build a model on which movies, kind of recommending which movies to watch. Tomorrow's rep, uh, recitation will be about collaborative filtering, this kind of the useful technique for doing this kind of thing. So you're going to build a model and deploy a model. And then we're actually going to maintain and monitor the model and update the model over time. So the assignment has a kind of a breakdown over, over multiple weeks of uh, what we're planning to do in each milestone. And this is a group project. So the idea is that um, you're working together as a group on this. I'm, I've been giving you a virtual machine where you can run this. And I've also given you, I think $200 worth of Amazon credit each, uh, which you can use. Um, you don't have to. You can also use whatever other tools you want. You can use, and I actually encourage you to use modern infrastructure rather than rolling everything on by yourself. Um, right, and it starts by, by essentially setting up movie predictions. I think the first challenge is just to get you started as a team. So um, to do this, I, I'm, I want to put you in breakout rooms as teams um, for the next 10 minutes. And I would like you to just say hi and figure out a way how you're communicating. So the first team deadline is next Tuesday. I hope the first assignment is fairly straightforward. Um, it's building and deploying a model. There's not a lot of kind of extra infrastructure work on this, not a lot of text and documentation work, but I think you need to figure out a rhythm of how to work together as a team, um, how to meet remotely, um, how to communicate. Um, do you want to set up a Slack channel? What form of communication do you want and so on? And I would like you to get started. Um, we're going to put you into groups. I'm going to hang out here in the main channel until uh, 4.30. So if you have any questions about kind of homework assignments, a class or anything today, come back here and I'll answer questions here. Um, but otherwise, 